Chapter 2 Enlightenment as Dialogue Critique of Ideology as Continuation of the Miscarried Dialogue Through Other Means Those who speak of cynicism will recall the limits of enlightenment. In this respect, focusing on the salient features of Weimar cynicism, apart from the advantage of making things clearer, also promises to be fruitful for the philosophy of history. The Weimar Republic represents, in the course of German history, not only a product of delayed development to nation-state, heavily burdened by the Wilhelminian legacy, the spirit of a cynically illiberal political system, but also a paradigm for, quote, enlightenment miscarried, end quote. It has often been shown how and why the early champions of Republican enlightenment, Republican enlightenment at that time, could not have been anything else but a desperately well-intentioned minority of representatives of reason against almost insurmountable odds. Massive currents of anti-enlightenment and hatred for the intelligentsia. An array of anti-democratic and authoritarian ideologies that knew how to effectively organise the public sphere. An aggressive nationalism with a desire for revenge. An unenlightenable unenlightenable confusion of stubborn conservatisms, displaced petty bourgeois, messianic religious sects, apocalyptic political views, and equally realistic and psychopathological rejections of the demands of a disagreeable modernity. The wounds of the war kept getting infected in the smouldering crisis. Nietzscheanism continued to be rampant, as the most prominent style of thinking for the German narcissistic sulkiness, and for the moody, arrogant, quote-unquote Protestant relationship to a quote-unquote bad reality. The climate of crisis-like agitation produced a penetrating psychopolitical oscillation between fear of the future and resentment, unstable pseudo-realisms and psychic makeshifts. If ever an epoch called for a historical psychopathology, it is the decade and a half between the fall of the empire and the establishment of National Socialism. The first impression turns out to be right here. Those who sought to promote enlightenment in such a society fought a losing battle. The powers of enlightenment were too weak for a precise number of reasons. Enlightenment was never able to ally itself effectively with the mass media, and individual self-determination was never an ideal for industrial monopolies and their organisations. How could it have been? Obviously, enlightenment is fragmented through the resistance of powers opposed to it. It would be wrong, however, to regard this only as a question of power arithmetic, for enlightenment is fragmented equally by a qualitative resistance in the opponent's consciousness. The latter fiercely resists the invitation to discussion and the undermining talk about truth. Even talking itself is resented, because through it, conventional views, values, and forms of self-assertion are brought into question. The interpretation of this resistance as a basic principle of ideology has become one of the main motifs of enlightenment. It is not only in modern times that enlightenment has had to deal with an opposed consciousness, that has increasingly entrenched itself in impregnable positions. In principle, the front can be traced back to the days of the Inquisition, 
If it is true that knowledge is power, as taught by the workers' movement, it is also true that not all knowledge is welcomed with open arms, because there are no truths that can be taken possession of without a struggle, and because all knowledge must choose a place in the configuration of hegemonic and oppositional forces. The means of establishing knowledge seems to be almost more important than the knowledge itself. In modern times, enlightenment shows itself to be a tactical complex. The demand to universalize the rational draws it into the vortex of politics, pedagogy, and propaganda. With this, enlightenment consciously represses the harsh realism of older precepts of wisdom, for which there was no question that the masses are foolish, and that Reason is to be found only among the few. Modern elitism has to encode itself democratically. It is not our task to give a historical account of the waning of enlightenment. We know that in the 18th and 19th centuries, in spite of considerable resistance and many contradictions, it succeeded for the most part with its sights set on its own achievements and plans, in dealing productively and progressively with the ferment of self-doubt. In spite of all hardships and setbacks to its development, it could still believe it had the law of progress on its side. Great names of that time bring to mind their achievements. Watt, Pasteur, Koch, Siemens. One can reject their achievements with disgruntlement, but that would be a gesture of mood, not of fairness. The press, the railroads, social welfare, penicillin. Who could deny that these are remarkable innovations in the quote-unquote garden of humanity? However, since the technological atrocities of the 20th century, from Verdun to the Gulag, from Auschwitz to Hiroshima, experience scorns all optimism. Historical consciousness and pessimism seem to amount to the same thing, and the catastrophes that have not yet happened, which are waiting in the wings, nurture the ever-present doubt about civilization. The late 20th century rides on a wave of negative futurism. Quote, the worst was already expected. It has just not yet happened. End quote. First, I want to restrict the theme of dissatisfied enlightenment to one point. The question concerning the means of power available to enlightenment confronted by an opposed consciousness. To inquire about quote-unquote means of power is already in a certain way incorrect, since enlightenment is essentially a matter of free consent. It is that quote-unquote, doctrine, that does not want to attribute its success to any pressure other than reason. One of its axes is reason, the other is the free dialogue of those striving for reason. Its methodological core and its moral ideal at one and the same time are voluntary consensus. By this is meant that the opposed consciousness does not change its position under any influence other than that of convincing argumentation. It is a matter of a sublimely peaceful event where, under the impact of plausible reasons, old, now untenable opinions are given up. Enlightenment thus contains within itself, so to speak, a utopian, archaic scene, an epistemological idyll of peace, a beautiful and academic vision, 
that of the free dialogue of those who, under no external compulsion, are interested in knowledge. Here, dispassionate individuals, not enslaved to their own consciousness, and not repressed by social ties, come together for a dialogue directed at truth under the laws of reason. The truth enlighteners want to disseminate. Uh, the truth enlighteners want to disseminate arises through a non-coerced, but compelling, acceptance of stronger arguments. The protagonist or discoverer of a, the protagonist or discoverer of an enlightened thought has taken this step only a short time earlier usually by surrendering an earlier opinion. The procedure of enlightenment accordingly has two aspects, the acceptance of a better position and the discarding, uh, discarding of the previous opinion. This gives rise to an um, oh for God's sake. <coughs> I'll learn to talk and then get back on it. This gives rise to an ambivalence of feelings, a gain and a pain. The utopia of a gentle, critical dialogue foresees this difficulty. The pain becomes bearable in consciousness so that it can be voluntarily accepted among colleagues as the price of commonality. The quote-unquote losers can view themselves as the real winners. Thus, the dialogue of enlightenment is essentially nothing other than a laborious wrestling with opinions and an exploratory dialogue among persons who submit a priori to rules of peace because they emerge from the confrontation only as winners, winners in knowledge and solidarity. For this reason, it is assumed that parting from previous opinions can be overcome. An academic idyll, as I have said, at the same time the regulative idea of any enlightenment that does not want to give up its hope for a reconciliation. That things proceed differently in reality will surprise no one. In the confrontations of enlightenment with preceding stances of consciousness, everything but truth is at stake hegemonic positions, class interests, established doctrines, desires, passions, and the defense of quote-unquote identities. These impediments so strongly remold the dialogue of enlightenment that it would be more appropriate to talk of a war of consciousness than a dialogue of peace. The opponents do not submit themselves to a previously agreed upon peace treaty. Rather, they confront each other in a competition directed at banishment and annihilation. And they are not free in relation to the powers that force their consciousness to speak just so, and in no other way. Faced with these sober facts, the discourse model reacts in a consciously unrealistic ways. It allows the arch-pragmatic statement, primum vivere di inde philosophari, to hold only conditionally. For it knows at least this much. Situations will recur repeatedly where quote-unquote philosophizing is the only thing that can help life along. It is tempting to poke fun at the quote-unquote methodological anti-realism of the dialogue idea, and part of this book indeed tries to help the derisive laughter about every form of foolish idealism get its due. However, when all contradictions have been taken into account, one will return here to the beginning, 
of course, with a consciousness that has gone through all the hells of realism. To preserve the healing fiction of a free dialogue is one of the last tasks of philosophy. Of course, enlightenment itself is the first to notice that it will not, quote-unquote, pull through with rational and verbal dialogue alone. No one can feel the faltering, the distorted assumptions about life, the ruptures, the miscarriages of the dialogue more keenly than it. At the beginning of ideology critique, there is also astonishment because the opponent is so hard of hearing, an astonishment that quickly gives way to a realistic awakening. Whoever does not want to hear, let others come to feel. Enlightenment is reminded how easily speaking openly can lead to camps and prisons. Hegemonic powers cannot be addressed so easily. They do not come voluntarily to the negotiating table with their opponents, whom they would prefer to have behind bars. But even tradition, if one is allowed to speak allegorically about it, initially has no interest in granting equal rights of speech to enlighteners. From the dawn of time, human sentiment has regarded the old as the true, and the new always as something questionable. This archaic feeling for truth had to be subdued by enlightenment before we could see the new as the true. Earlier, one took for granted that political and spiritual hegemonic powers were allied in a conservative front, disinclined to all innovations. Wherever spiritual reforms took place, I have in mind above all the monastic movements of the Middle Ages and the religious upheavals of the 16th century, they saw themselves as, quote-unquote, conservative revolutions, obeying a call for the return to the roots. Finally, in addition to hegemonic powers and traditions, people's minds, already too full, constitute a third authority that does not really care to listen to the spirit of enlightened innovation. They counter enlightenment with the resistance of ingrained habits and established attitudes that firmly occupy the space of consciousness, and that can be brought to listen to a reason other than conventional wisdom only in exceptional circumstances. However, the vessel of knowledge cannot be filled twice. Enlightenment, as critique, recognises in everything that it is already there in people's minds, its inner arch-enemy. It, it gives this enemy a contemptuous name. Prejudices. The threefold polemic in a critique of power, in the struggle against tradition, and in a war against prejudices, is part of the traditional image of enlightenment. All three imply a struggle with opponents disinclined to dialogue. Enlightenment wants to talk to them about things that hegemonic powers and traditions prefer to keep quiet about. Reason, justice, equality, freedom truth, research. Through silence, the status quo is more likely to remain secure. Through talk, one is pursuing an uncertain future. Enlightenment enters this dialogue virtually empty-handed. It has only the fragile offer of free consent to the better argument. If it could gain acceptance by force, it would be not enlightenment, but a variation of a free consciousness. Thus it is true. As a rule, people stick to their positions for anything but rational reasons. <laughs>
what can be done. Enlightenment has tried to make the best of the situation. Since nothing was freely given to it, it developed almost from the beginning, besides the friendly invitation to a conversation, a second combative stance. It receives blows, so it returns them. Some exchanges are so old that it would be senseless to ask who started them. The history of ideology critique comprises to a large extent the history of the second polemical gesture, the history of a great counter-offensive. Such critique, as theory of struggle, serves enlightenment in a twofold way, as a weapon against a hardened, conservative, complacent consciousness, and as an instrument for practice and gaining inner strength. Those who do not want to participate in enlightenment must have their reasons, and they are probably not the alleged reasons. Resistance itself becomes a topic in enlightenment. The opponents thus necessarily become cases, their consciousness an object. Because they do not want to talk with us, we have to talk about them. But, as in every combative attitude, the opponents are from then on thought of not as egos, but as apparatuses, in which, partly openly, partly secretly, a mechanism of resistance is at work that renders them unfree and leads them to errors and illusions. A statement in italics here. Ideology critique means the polemical continuation of the miscarried dialogue through other means. It declares a war on consciousness, even when it pretends to be so serious and quote-unquote non-polemical. The rules for peace are in substance rescinded. At this point it becomes clear that there is no intersubjectivity that could not equally well be interobjectivity. In hitting and being hit, both parties become subjective objects for each other. Strictly speaking, ideology critique wants not merely to hit, but to operate with precision, in the surgical and military sense, to outflank and expose opponents, to reveal the opponent's intentions. Exposing implies laying out the mechanism of false and unfree consciousness. In principle, enlightenment knows only two grounds for falsity, error and ill will. At best, only the latter can possess the dignity of a subject, for only when opponents consciously lie does the quote-unquote wrong opinion possess an ego. If one assumes error, the wrong opinion rests not on an ego, but on a mechanism that falsifies the right opinion. Only a lie bears responsibility for itself, whereas an error, because it is mechanical, remains in relative innocence. Error, however, quickly splits into two different phenomena. The simple error, which is based on logical or perceptual delusion and can be corrected relatively easily, and the persistent systematic error, which clings to its own conditions of existence and is called ideology. Thus arise the classic series of forms of false consciousness, lie, error, ideology. Thus arise the classic series of forms of false consciousness. Lie, error, ideology. Every struggle leads necessarily to a reciprocal reification of subjects. Because enlightenment cannot give up its claim of imposing better insights against a self-obstructing consciousness, it must basically operate behind the opponent's consciousness, 
Thus, ideology critique acquires a cruel aspect that, if it ever really admits to being cruel, claims to be nothing more than a reaction to the cruelties of ideology. Here it becomes clearer than anywhere else that philosophical ideology critique is truly the heir of a great satirical tradition in which the motif of unmasking, exposing, bearing has served for aeons now as a weapon. But modern ideology critique, according to our thesis, has ominously cut itself off from the powerful traditions of laughter and satirical knowledge, which have their roots in ancient kinicism. Recent ideology critique already appears in respectable garb, and in Marxism, and especially in psychoanalysis, it has even put on suit and tie, so as to completely assume an air of bourgeois respectability. It has given up its life as satire in order to win its position in books as quote-unquote theory. From the lively form of heated polemic it was, it has retreated to those positions taken in a cold war of consciousness. Heinrich Heine was one of the last authors of classical enlightenment who literarily defended in open satire the rights of ideology critique to, quote, just atrocities, unquote. Here the public has not followed him. The bourgeois transformation of satire into ideology critique was as inevitable as the bourgeois transformation of society, in general, together with its oppositional forces. Ideology critique, having become respectable, imitates surgical procedure. Cut open the patient with the critical scalpel and operate under impeccably sterile conditions. The opponent is cut open in front of everyone until the mechanism of his error is laid bare. The outer skin of delusion and the nerve endings of quote-unquote actual motives are hygienically separated and prepared. From then on, enlightenment is not satisfied, of course, but it is better armed in its insistence on its own claims for the distant future. Ideology critique is now interested not in winning over the vivisected opponent, but in focusing on the corpse, the critical extract of its ideas which lie in the libraries of enlighteners, and in which one can easily read about their grave falsity. Obviously, one does not get any closer to the opponent in this way. Those who previously did not want to engage in enlightenment will want to do so even less now that they have been dissected and exposed by the opponent. Of course, according to the logic of the game, the enlightener will at least be victorious. Sooner or later, the opponent will be forced to respond apologetically. Irritated by the attacks and unmaskings, the counter-enlighteners will one day begin to conduct their own quote-unquote enlightenment, enlightenment on the enlighteners in order to denounce them as human beings and to associate them socially with criminals. They are then usually called elements. The word is unintentionally well chosen since wanting to fight the elements does not sound very promising. Eventually, it cannot be avoided. The hegemonic powers begin to talk indiscreetly. Then, increasingly irritated, they reveal something of their secrets. Universally acknowledged cultural ideas are thereby cunningly retraced. In the compulsion of the weakened hegemonic powers to confess, as remains to be shown, lies one of the roots of the modern cynical structure. without wanting to, quote-unquote, dissatisfied enlightenment, has, in turn, entrenched itself on this front. Threatened by its own fatigue and undermined by the need for seriousness, 
it often remains content with having wrung involuntary confessions from its opponent. In fact, in time, the experienced eye will see confessions everywhere, and even when the hegemonic power shoots instead of negotiating, it will not be difficult to interpret bullets as the revelations of a fundamental weakness. That is how the powers express themselves that have no imagination, and that, in order to save themselves, cling to nothing more than their strong nerves and executive organs. Arguing behind the back and through the head of the opponent has become common practice in modern critique. The gesture of exposure characterises the style of argumentation of ideology critique, from the critique of religion in the 18th century to the critique of fascism in the 20th. Everywhere one discovers extra-rational mechanisms of opinion, interests, passions, fixations, illusions. That helps a bit to mitigate the scandalous contradiction between the postulated unity of truth and the factual plurality of opinions, since it cannot be eliminated. Under these assumptions, a true theory would be one that not only grounds its own theses best, but also knows how to diffuse all significant and persistent counterpositions through ideology critique. In this point, as one can easily see, official Marxism has the greatest ambition, since the major part of its theoretical energy is dedicated to outdoing all non-Marxist theories and exposing them as quote-unquote bourgeois ideologies. Only by continually outdoing the others can ideologists succeed in quote-unquote living with the plurality of ideologies. De facto, the critique of ideology implies the attempt to construct a hierarchy between unmasking and unmasked theory. In the war of consciousness, getting on top, that is, achieving a synthesis of claims to power and better insights, is crucial. Since, in the business of critique, contrary to academic custom, ad hominem arguments are used unhesitatingly, Universities have, probably deliberately, moved cautiously toward the procedures of ideology critique. For the attack from the flank, the argumentum ad personam, is strongly disapproved of in the quote-unquote academic community. Respectable critique meets its opponents in its best form. Critique honours itself when it overwhelms its rival in the full armour of its rationality. For as long as possible, the learned collegium has tried to defend its integrity against the close combat of ideologico-critical exposures. Do not unmask, lest you yourself be unmasked. That could be the unspoken rule. It is no accident that the great representatives of critique, the French moralists, the encyclopedists, the socialists, and especially Heine, Marx, Nietzsche, and Freud, remain outsiders in the scholarly domain. In all of them there is a satirical, polemical component that can scarcely be hidden under the mask of scholarly respectability. These signals of a holy non-seriousness, which remains one of the sure indexes of truth, can be employed as signposts to the critique of cynical reason. We will find a reliably unreliable travelling companion in Heinrich Heine, who displayed a knack, unsurpassed to the present day, for combining theory and satire, cognition and entertainment. Here, following in his tracks, we want to try to reunite the capacities for truth and literature, satire and art, with those of quote-unquote scholarly discourse. The right of ideology critique to use ad hominem arguments was 
indirectly acknowledged even by the strictest absolutist of reason, J. G. Fichte, whom Heine aptly compared to Napoleon when he said that the kind of philosophy one chooses depends on the kind of person one is. This critique intrudes into the conditions under which human beings form opinions with either compassionate serenity or cruel seriousness. It seizes error from behind and tears at its roots in practical life. This procedure is not exactly modest, but its immodesty is excused with a reference to the principle of the unity of truth. What is brought to light by the vivisecting approach is the everlasting embarrassment of ideas confronted by the interests underlying them. Human all too human. Egoisms, class privileges, resentments, steadfastness of hegemonic powers. Under such illumination, the opposing subject appears not only psychologically, but also sociologically and politically undermined. Accordingly, its standpoint can be understood only if one adds to its self-betrayals what is, in fact, hidden behind and below them. In this way, ideology critique raises a claim that it shares with hermeneutics, namely the claim to understand a author better than he understands himself. What at first sounds arrogant about this claim can be methodologically justified. Others often really do perceive things about me that escape my attention. And conversely, they possess the advantage of distance, which I can profit from only retrospectively through dialogic mirroring. This of course would presuppose a functioning dialogue which is precisely what does not take place in the process of ideology critique. An ideology critique that does not clearly accept its identity as satire can, however, easily be transformed from an instrument in the search for truth into one of dogmatism. All too often, it interferes with the capacity for dialogue instead of opening up new paths for it. While well, this explains, leaving general anti-scholastic and anti-intellectual feelings aside, a part of the current dissatisfaction with the critique of ideology. Thus it happens that an ideology critique that presents itself as science, because it is not allowed to be satire, gets more and more entangled in serious, radical solutions. One of these is the striking tendency to seek refuge in psychopathology. False consciousness appears first of all as sick consciousness. Mm. Mm, pardon me. Almost all important works of the 20th century on the phenomenon of ideology do the same thing. From Sigmund Freud and Wilhelm Reich to R. D. Leng and David Cooper, not to mention Joseph Gable, who has pushed the analogy between ideology and schizophrenia furthest. Those stances are suspected of being sick that loudly proclaim themselves to be the healthiest, most normal and natural. The reliance of critique on psychopathology, although probably well justified, risks alienating the opponent more and more deeply it reifies and diminishes the other's reality. In the end, the critique of ideology stands before the opposing consciousness, like one of those modern, highly specialised pathologists who can, of course, say precisely what kind of pathological disturbance the patient is suffering from, but knows nothing about appropriate therapies because that is not his specialty. Such critics like some medicos corrupted by their profession, are interested in the diseases, not in the patients. <laughs>
the most humorless reification of every opposing consciousness has grown out of the ideology critique that bases itself on Marx. I will not go into whether this is a proper use or misuse of Marx. The radical reification of the opponent is in fact <clears throat> the radical reification of the opponent is in any case of factual consequence of the <laughs> let me try that again the radical reification of the opponent is in any case of factual consequence of the politico-economic realism characteristic of Marxian theory maybe that's supposed to mean the radical reification of the opponent is in any case a factual consequence of the political economic realism characteristic of Marxian theory well it is not up to the reader to correct the author so I assume Sloterdijk means what he says let's continue <clears throat> however here an additional motif comes into play if all other exposures trace false consciousness back to seamy features of the human totality lies nastiness egoism repression split consciousness illusion wishful thinking etc etc the marxian exposure runs up against the non-subjective the laws of the politico-economic process as a whole when ideologies are criticized from a politico-economic perspective one never really gets down to quote-unquote human weaknesses rather one hits on an abstract social mechanism in which individual persons as members of classes have distinct functions as capitalist as proletarian as intermediate functionary as theoretical hack for the system however neither in the head nor in the components of the system is there any clarity about the nature of the whole each of its members is mystified in a way corresponding to its position even the capitalist in spite of practical experience with capital finds no true image of the total structure but remains a necessarily deceived epiphenomenon epiphenomenon of the process of capital it is here that a second offshoot of modern cynicism grows as soon as I assume in Marx's formulation a quote necessarily false consciousness end quote the spiral of reification is turned even further there would then be in the minds of human beings precisely those errors that have to be in them so that the system can function toward its collapse in the gaze of the Marxist system critic there glitters an irony that is a priori condemned to cynicism for the critic admits that ideologies which from an external point of view are false consciousness are seen from the inside precisely the right consciousness ideologies appear simply as the appropriate errors in the corresponding minds the quote unquote correct false consciousness this echoes the definition of cynicism given in its first preliminary reflection chapter one the difference is that the marxist critic gives quote unquote correct false consciousness the chance to enlighten itself or to be enlightened through marxism then in the critic's opinion it would have become true consciousness not quote unquote enlightened false consciousness as the formula for cynicism says theoretically the perspective of emancipation is kept open any sociological system theory that treats quote-unquote truth functionalistically 
I say this in advance, carries an immense potential for cynicism. And since every contemporary intellect is caught up in the process of such sociological theories, and inevitably is implicated in the latent or overt master cynicism of these forms of thinking. Marxism and its origins, at least maintained an ambivalence between reifying and emancipative perspectives. Non-Marxist system theories of society drop even the last trace of sensitivity. In alliance with neoconservative currents, they proclaim that useful members of human society have to internalise certain quote-unquote correct illusions once and for all, because without them, nothing functions properly. The naivete of the others should be planned, quote, capital fix being man himself, end quote. It is always a good investment to mobilise the naive will to work, for whatever reason. System theoreticians and maintenance strategists are from the start beyond naive belief. But for those who should believe in it, the aphorism holds. Stop reflecting and maintain values. Those who make the means of liberating reflection available and invite others to use them, appear to conservatives as unscrupulous and power-hungry good-for-nothings who are reproached with, quote, others do the work, end quote. Very well. But for whom? Mm -hmm.